have a very bad writing now there is a request uh, and vikas i need your help here then sir sir ji sir ji is somebody is asking me to do a bilingual lecture Can yeah actually sir it's a request because we have some uh, hindi background students if it is possible otherwise it's okay sir okay. sir basically it depend on you Okay. Okay. So, so what we will uh, yes. Uh, but usually we uh, we can try to say certain things in Hindi. Uh, but I the rest of the audience if they understand Hindi or not. Okay. So it's a little challenge for us always as the speaker. Uh, so how much balance we can do? so i will try to do okay to as uh, simplified as possible okay uh, thank you very much sir okay so this uh, particular like and then we switch on to qualitative methods because that is the focus of your uh, today session that i am doing with you so as far as method is concerned and method is just a particular way a particular path of answering the question that you are interested in so as a researcher we are interested in all kinds of questions now how do you answer that question now to answer any question you require a method and that's why broadly speaking there is qualitative research method then there is quantitative research method and then there is historical research method which primarily relies on archival research or documents older historical documents okay uh, as far as quantitative and uh, the historical one is concerned i will talk very briefly but in the question and answer session you can ask more questions so first thing that you must remember while conducting your exercise while carrying out your research in the first place is you should have a decently defined question i am not saying a very perfect question you need a decently defined question if you have a question wrong you will have a method wrong and you will have a analysis absolutely terrible or even pathetic to say the least now that i have changed the side from being a student to being a post phd post doc a professor now and now i also evaluate phd thesis so let me tell you one thing very clearly that the first thing that many students get wrong is the research question and the sub questions that are necessary to answer the main question because you get the sub question wrong your method is wrong and because your method is wrong the material you gather is definitely all over the world and therefore you cannot actually do an analysis so it's like holding the seven horses together with one particular cord or rope how can you do that that is where methods are absolutely important so if your research requires a qualitative investigation you will go with qualitative research if your question requires you to do quantitative research you will go and do quantitative research or if your research requires to go to some archives or to go to some newspaper reports older newspaper reports you will follow that method okay. now there is also the th other fourth approach which is you mix either of these methods which is we call as multi method research some people call it mixed method some people call it multi method research research the bottom line being that you rely on two three different mechanisms to answer the same bigger question that you are interested now when we say qualitative research you have interviews which are in depth interviews semi structured interviews structured interviews informal discussions you have ethnography which is the long uh, period that you spend in one particular setting that's ethnography now ethnography again has various aspects one is uh, where you become part of the system that is if you are studying let's say the um, swiggy workers or zomato workers 
you also enroll yourself with zomato company and you enroll yourself as a rider and you spend 6 months understanding the problem you become friends with other zomato drivers and then you actually uh, analyze that the other way of ethnography is you spend a lot of time with zomato drivers but you don't become one so there are different shades within qualitative research as far as quantitative research is concerned you use already existing data such as the census data or the national sample survey organization or the indian human development survey data so there are various agencies that collect data and you just uh, get use that raw data what the way it is originally collected and then you uh, engage with certain questions and try to make a big kind of story out of it and within quantitative the second part is you gather your own survey data if uh, the existing survey data does not answer your variables now as far as archival research is concerned as i said you go to the state archives delhi state archives you go to the national archives in delhi or any state archives or if you want to study any municipal corporation zilla parishad they will have their files so archives is not one particular a uh, place where only you can use documents so there are different ways so the point here is and i'll reiterate you have to have a decently and i will underline the word decently clear cut question that will help you to actually identify your uh, further research now why do we choose qualitative research that is the most important part here you have to first think that do you really need qualitative research or you are doing it just because you think you know i just have to pick up one method so i'll pick up qualitative research. so qualitative is also known as an inductive method which is that you pick up specific facts and you draw inferences okay i'll i'll come to these things very you know gradually so don't worry about uh what do we mean by specific facts and what do we mean by particular to general the point here is that our sample size is always low compared to the survey data so survey data goes into large sample in order to make generalizations but qualitative research does not have that luxury what do we do in qualitative research is we go and identify our respondents that we think that okay if we want to do a work uh, farmers protest let's say for example so we go to the farmers uh, and we begin to uh, interview them now within farmers there is a long way large variety so first is the big farmers second thing is the medium and then second third are the uh, small and marginal farmers that is one variety the second variety is that who has irrigation facilities who do not have irrigation facilities then the third variable is whether they have different kind of modern equipments those who don't have modern equipments then the fourth one is in terms of their religious background then again you go one layer down caste background then again you go one down people with only women household so the point of putting these layers is that you should have a representative sample so even if you do 20 interviews that's absolutely not a problem as long as you have a representative sample so if all these different variations are taken into account you can do a decent analysis even with 20 or 25 interviews but that cannot happen with survey with survey you need uh, again a representative so if you're talking about 10000 people we can at least we need at least uh, you know 100 200 a minimum number of sample is always required to do statistical analysis uh, but as far as qualitative is concerned we need to have a representative sample even if these are 20 interviews 15 interviews unless and until they are representative you cannot make good arguments and that's why it is from particular these particular case studies to general and they also lead us to engage with larger theories so why do we gather all this data of course you have a question and these questions may have been answered partly in different context by different authors using different methods or same methods you think that the situation has changed now 
let me ask the same question and engage with that existing literature and with that kind of agenda in your mind you actually process the data and then see that okay what what is happening to let's say inequalities are they changing if yes what is the factor behind that particular change okay is it getting better for some is it getting worse for some how do we explain that okay so it's all about explaining the patterns so the question is about how and why these processes develop how has this particular change taken place why has it taken place survey data will tell you what exactly is the situation now why is the situation like that we have no idea for example the jats in haryana the marathas in maharashtra or some of the dominant caste other places they have high income group so majority of the people in the these caste groups have higher income status yet when it comes to the occupation the educational attainment it's a very low educational attainment so it is actually surprising that on one hand these are the communities who have more than enough resources compared to even the most historically socially superior caste such as the brahmins in some cases and yet their educational attainment is very low and in order to answer that question the data can't go beyond a point for that you need to have these kind of qualitative mechanisms which will tell you why this process is happening that why despite having so much money they actually have not been able to take education how is it possible what exactly are the factors here okay. and that's why we pick up qualitative research method of course um, you can have your own examples now there are uh, roughly 55 students attending so there will be 50 projects so we will have different reasons okay now as far as qualitative methods are concerned and i will come to writing in a bit okay so i'm just wrapping up the method section now as far as qualitative methods are concerned how do we choose whether we will do in depth interviews structured once or we do semi structured interviews or any method within qualitative research so if you want to do structured in depth interviews their access is not a problem you will have enough uh, either uh, what is it called the gatekeepers who will help you to connect you to the uh, your research uh, kind of target group uh, or you can walk on your own and it will be still fine to uh, talk to the people so access is not a problem there is no potential threat the, these are communities whom you can talk easily and it's not at all a problem uh semi structured interviews are the ones where you also have uh more or less access but you still want to keep certain questions open that you have more or less questions which you want to ask but you also want to leave a small space open so that you know whatever the way discussion develops you can actually pick up the data then there are focus group discussions people always say that it's not like you know we prepare uh, some vegetable or meat or chicken or some you know some alu sabzi that you add all kinds of spices that's not the way it works you actually add only what is needed or you adapt to the cheese situations so focus group discussion happens when of course you want to talk to a group but sometimes there are occasions where you just cannot do anything but you have to talk to the group so for example i went to a village in western maharashtra and i wanted to talk to the factory workers who went back to villages now each time i would sit and talk with one worker there would be always three or four people who would come and they would intervene into the questions and they would start answering beyond 5 10 minutes it's impossible to do an interview with that one person at that moment you don't have any other choice but to conduct a focus group discussions so while focus group discussion has its strengths it also has its weaknesses because it is possible that there are some voices we hear and other voices we don't but nonetheless the point of focus group discussion is that when you are left with no other choice in many cases you end up doing focus group discussion then there is something called informal conversation to the field will associate with this very easily is we use this mechanism of informal 
Uh, they will get afraid of why exactly you are doing this interview. Maybe you are from some government office, and maybe there will be some problem for their own facilities already that they receive, and that will intimidate them. They will get scared of answering to your questions, and therefore, informal conversations is absolutely one of the best ways of conducting qualitative research uh, method. Uh, in this case, what you do is you can take some notes, one or two here and there. But what you do essentially is you have to really remember the conversation. And once the interview is over after one or two hours, you have to go to your room or wherever place somewhere below the tree or some you know cafe or whatever place and write down all the conversation as much as possible. In fact, this is one of the most powerful. Uh, ways of gathering the data because people feel relaxed talking to you. They are not intimidated. The moment you have your pen and paper, there are chances, depending on what you are studying, they can get intimidated. Okay, and therefore, informal conversation has its own value. Informal conversation also happens because what we call as opportunistic interview. That, of course, when we decide that this is our target group, you always go and say that I want to interview someone like this, someone like that. But during field work, you actually just happen to meet somebody. Now, you can't say to that person that, look, I really want to interview, but I can see that you're going to go away. Uh, you make best use of that. You make best use of that particular uh, in encounter with that person. You sit and you just take down. The second last part here is about non-participant observation. That a particular event is happening and you just sit in the corner and you observe. Sometimes you can be also sitting in the middle of that people and you can still observe. In this, uh, this is a situation where uh, for various reasons you cannot talk to people, uh, but of course you can observe what they are doing. You can listen to what they are saying. And this is one of the very important sources of information that can be used to analyze the qualitative data. Then the last is participant observation that you are uh, involved, you can actually be, um, you know, you can participate in the observation, but you can also observe overall. Uh, and you can, there is a way you can also ask questions. So, as far as qualitative methods is concerned, you need to be clear on what kind of method you are using. Because, uh, you know, when we look at any thesis uh, for evaluation, one of the first things that we look at is the method section and how clearly. Uh, any method is written. If you say you have done structured interviews, you need we need the numbers. We need the time frame on where you have done. We need the place you have done. We need to know the exact target population. You need to know the social demographic, whether these are men, these are women, these are poor people, middle class people, uh, in terms of their uh, religion, their caste. We need a breakup of everything. Once we know that what kind of people you have researched, it's far more easier for an external examiner to evaluate your research. Now, this is not just about PhD thesis, but this is also about peer review. So when you submit an article to the journal, uh, it very likely happens that uh, much of the rejection happens because you're absolutely not telling us clearly what exactly method you have used, what is your sample size, when did you conduct the field work, and what exactly uh, you know, is the entire setting of your research. If that is done clearly, it's very easy to follow uh, uh, the written document. So make sure that next time you write your either thesis or journal article, you actually specify what exactly uh, this particular question will um, make use of. So you state that this is a larger problem. This is my research question. And to answer this question, I'm going to use qualitative method, survey method, or archival research. And don't just stop there. You have to tell what exactly you mean by qualitative method. How many people did you speak? How many focus group discussion? And within each focus group discussion, how many people were involved in that discussion? Okay. Non-participative observation. What kind of people are you observing? Are these 100 people, 20 people, 10 people? Where were you observing them? It's actually very good to write a detailed note of your uh, method. Now, let me come to my own study very quickly and then talk about writing. So as far as my own PhD is concerned, what I was interested is in looking at how the factory workers respond to joblessness. 
So from 1998 to 2006, the big textile mills in Mumbai, the way you have in Ahmedabad, Kanpur, Kolkata, uh, you have the coal mines, you have the steel plants in Bhilai, in Jamshedpur, Raurkila. So these are very huge manufacturing kind of industries. So Bombay has been historic textile industry. Closed down nearly 95,000 to 1 lakh workers, sorry, workers lost their jobs. And my interest was how do they respond to joblessness? So my target was number one, all those mill workers who lost their jobs after 1998, but till 2006. I was not interested in anyone who lost their job in 1989, 82, 85 or 93. My target was 98 onwards because that was the time when the first factory closed down permanently. So you have to have very clear cut, well defined reason why you say that you will target only those factory workers or your sample population. In my case, it was the cotton textile mill workers. That was the first thing. The second thing was I used snowball sampling because obviously I wanted to cover as much variety as possible as far as qualitative interviews concerned. Then obviously there was group discussion. As I said, in some cases, it was impossible to do uh, interviews. So group discussion became an obvious mechanism. Then non-participant observation. So if you look at the right side of my uh, you know, table here, so I have total 80 interviews. And from the 80 interviews, there is a breakup of total in terms of their caste and religious background of the workers. Now of the total workers, these were the main groups. And I had to make sure that um, I have enough of these uh, numbers as far as taking the representative sample is concerned. Now, if you look at uh, some of the groups, you know, the high caste Hindus are 19, then the OBCs are 3, Dalits are 28, Muslims 28, and miscellaneous 2. And ask why exactly is this variation? How can one defend these variations? Uh, although the fact is that the proportion of Muslims and Dalits was absolutely less by the time the the reason for taking slightly more sample is that I had not reached what is called as saturation. So till the time you are getting same response. So let's say if I interview five people, more or less, they say the same thing. Then I feel, okay, five is not enough. I go for eight. I go for 10 maybe. And I realized that actually they are saying more or less the same thing. And I need to stop here. That is called saturation. Once you start receiving absolutely same information, which means you're not going to gain new information. So either you need to change sample within that group or you need to stop. So in my case, I tried to change the sample. So within high caste Hindus, I tried to look at from people from Maharashtra, from UP, from South. Same with Dalits. I tried to look from Maharashtra, from North, from the West. Uh, or the South uh, and the Muslims as well. Once, but with these two population, Muslims and Dalits, the variation was little higher. So I had to look for new sample till I reached the sage stage of saturation. And you do reach a sage stage of saturation because you know that now more or less people are saying the same thing. So you don't need to go ahead. So everybody knows the map of India. This is especially for the Western audience, but Mumbai is the capital of Maharashtra state and this is the map of Mumbai on the right hand side. The red circle that you see is my field study where all the 58 textile mills which employed 95,000 workers uh, were located. Historically, you if you go to Mumbai city, you will still find uh, the older structures uh, that are very much prevalent. But as far as the people are concerned, they lived here for a very long time. But post 1950s, they moved to the suburbs of Mumbai, up to here in the north on both sides. Uh, so that is the setting as far as my research is concerned. Now let me come to the writing part. What exactly do you do? Okay. So my broader question is, how do mill workers respond to joblessness? Now the underlying feature here is the response. That how do they respond? Now, there cannot be one response. So what I did is I looked at three broad responses. The first response was that they decided to go back to villages. And then what I did is 
I looked at people who have gone back to villages and to see whether their strategy of going back to villages has been successful or not. And in this question, I related to the wider literature on the rural urban migration and the challenges worker faced in the urban areas. Now I relate with the same literature, but I look at all the interviews and I ask them, are you comfortable in the village? What exactly challenges do you face? Uh, was, this, was the city better? Is the village better? By asking these questions, I have a decent amount of information uh, from the workers where I know where, where exactly things are happening and how you can relate to the literature. So first question is that how do they respond to joblessness in terms of going back to villages? So this is their one response. Second is that if you're jobless, the immediate question is that you need to find some job. So that is what I looked at in the case of those workers who stayed in the city. That as far as these workers are concerned, they have to find a job. Now in finding a new job, my question was, of course, they will find some job. But did their social background in terms of their gender, in terms of their religion, in terms of their caste, did it have any influence on their occupational choices? And the third response is political mobilization. That they decide to or reorganize again and demand from the government of Maharashtra that they need a free housing in the Mumbai city or a subsidized housing. Now in doing so, what I do is I track their political mobilization. I track their regular meetings. I go and attend their meetings. I see what kind of languages they use. I see how they actually ensure that worker come to the rallies, how they mobilize that and how that may or may not have influence on electoral politics. Of course, these are three dimensions as far as response is concerned. But as far as my own information is concerned, there is a lot one can do. In fact, I'll tell you that from my PhD, I have not even used more than 20 to 25 percent of data. My 80 percent, nearly 75 to 80 percent data is still in my computer and something interesting can be still written. So that is a lesson that you must remember that not everything that you collect from the field has to be used for writing your thesis. Now what one of the best ways to do your write up is of course we have a particular way in the Indian system where uh, you have to give a proposal and more or less chapterization and your problem begins with that. That you tend to think only in the original chapterization that you have given while submitting the research proposal. But of course once you collect the data you may actually find something interesting. One of the first exercise that you need to do is that you must sit after like two, three months of data collection and start writing down the patterns that you can observe. Okay, Don't engage with literature. I'm assuming you have read some literature in advance. So you start writing some patterns. No matter what you think about it, just write down long possible notes, number one. And you keep an eye on certain patterns. At the end of your field work, you create an outline you make a, a kind of subheading. So in my case, I thought, okay, return migration is one thing. So I wrote return migration. What exactly is coming in return migration? I did some subheadings. I did not do immediately chapter writing, but I'm just making a map of all the chapters. Second theme that I realized was the jobs I was interested in. What exactly new jobs are they doing and how challenging was it? So then I started writing new jobs or new occupations. Then you, you create a map. What will you do? You will have an introduction. You will talk about what kind of jobs they were doing. You will talk about the challenges. You will talk about the variations among the workers. And then you will engage with the wider literature and say, uh, you know, what exactly happens in the modern urban industrial context, which has now transformed into a service sector economy. So you have to create a map. In your situation, because you already have a map which you submit while uh, writing the proposal, then you can map this together and then you can modify and write. Don't stick to the original mapping that you have submitted. You need to create a separate map of all the three to four major themes that emerge 
and on that basis you should write your thesis one of the major things i always see a major problem in evaluating the thesis it's let's say if you want to write about uh, delhi you start from the sultanate period or even before that that is not needed if your research is related to 2010 delhi waste pickers problem you can write a historical section in like 2 3 pages but don't write two chapters only on the history of delhi that is the most absolutely horrible supervision that people receive that your actual material that you collect we end up reading on fourth chapter of course first is introduction in second most cases is a methodology chapter but from third chapter onwards we should actually see your um, empirical material being used and a research lit- uh, literature review is another exercise we we can talk now in a bit or later but as far as qualitative methods is concerned this is my suggestion as far as going ahead is concerned first pick up one or two good questions and constantly read your research proposal while you go to the field for the first one month i read my own research proposal every night i came from field work the only reason to do this exercise is that you don't forget what exactly you are here on the field work for because field is an absolutely exciting space you'll get really distracted by every other thing so that is your first exercise you have a good question you stick to it so minor modifications are allow once you do that you have done your data collection following a proper rigorous method the second thing you need to do is prepare an outline based on the research that you think ah okay maybe state and violence is one thing that is coming out what exactly material do i have now by then you would have conducted interviews you would have conducted uh, gathered some historical topic documents certain newspaper reports certain government commission reports some ngo reports so you write down first the outline make an outline of each chapter that you have in mind and how will you answer that to the material then you can say that okay for this answer i will refer to the interviews with this 10 people or 15 people i will use this report you need to create a good outline once you have created a good outline then you pick up one of your favorite themes and you start writing the chapter once you start writing that particular chapter then you engage with what literature is there so you have your story you see a pattern emerging from the kind of exercise you do and then you see what other scholars have said about that particular part you don't go always from top to bottom oh this scholar has said something now my job is to tell how wrong that scholar is see that particular exercise you are not going contributing anything to the academic literature if you are interested in contributing to academic literature you should see how that argument is built up one of the things that we look at as scholars is when somebody is making an argument we see what exactly is the basis of that argument do you have some records did you conduct a, conduct some interviews is it a survey based text and what are the limitations of it <clears throat> if you keep this in mind you will actually have a good qualitative thesis or research papers okay on that note i'll stop please feel free to ask questions in hindi as well uh, we are not used to speaking at length in hindi honestly as far as academic thing is concerned uh so that's why i could not switch to hindi but as far as answers questions are concerned i will try my best to also answer in hindi so please go ahead thank you very much thank you very much sir thank you very much and uh, uh, for you are very insightful mm-hmm. that sir thank you so much now i would like to uh, uh i would like to basically ask the our participants if they have any query any questions so they can ask so kindly sir, please I, raise sir, your hand i have one question okay shivangi please introduce yourself your university then ask the question 
Uh, sir, my name is Shivangi Singh. I'm doing research from University of Allahabad. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, my question is, uh, my work is on women entrepreneur mm -hmm. who is worked in uh, working in cottage industry. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, uh, uh, in the new definition of cottage, uh, uh, is MSME definition, mm -hmm. basically the cottage industry definition is not uh, very mentioned there. So, uh, my biggest concern is that how I select my uh, sample size and my area is Prayagraj district. So, uh, please tell me the proper way to select the sample size. First, you have to see, I'm not an expert on MSME, but as far as MSME is concerned, it has a particular definition, right? Yes, sir. In terms of the size of the uh, entrepreneurship, in uh, terms yes. of the capital that is involved. Uh, sir, in my basically question is how how we sel select a proper sample size in a especially in a primary data. So in any yeah yeah so in any setting the sample size that you have to select is first you need to know the population. Who are these entrepreneurs first of all? Okay, now if you want to only select women within women, who are these entrepreneurs? So first thing is you already have sorted that you have Prayagraj as a district number one, so that problem is solved. Second thing, within Prayagraj, you want to look at cottage industries, right? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so cottage industries also is solved. Then you have specifically looking at women. So you have to look at within women, what exactly is the variety? A, it could be based on, of course, it has to be have, it has to have all the tick boxes. Now within cottage industry, there could be women who have bigger businesses and smaller businesses, okay? So that is the first thing you need to do. Second thing you need to do is look at if they are supported by their husbands or their family members. That is another criteria in terms of selecting the sample. Mm -hmm. Then whether religion plays an important role, you need to divide the population by religion. Then if caste is playing an important role in the sample, let's say if all the women in your sample belong to more or less one or two caste, then you are more or less sorted that you need 50-50 uh, kind of sample from both the communities within those women groups. Okay. But if that is not the case, then you need to make tick boxes. So first you need to know who is your sample. So you need to talk to people. Generally, when you talk to people, you get a sense uh, what kind of people are involved, what is the group, what is the social background of this group, what are the you know economic status within that group. And then you say that, okay, Let's say, for example, in your case, in the cottage industries, there are like women, there are 50% women who have small scale enterprise and 50% women who have large scale. So in your sample as well, you should try as much as possible out of the 20 interviews, 10 should be from small scale, 10 should be from large scale. Now, second layer here is community. So you need to figure out that representation. That, that's how it is. Sir, sorry to disturb you. Sir, my area is totally based on informal in nature. So That's women are not... No problem. Yes. Sir, so is even... there any method? Because, uh, sir, my uh, uh, professor always asks to me which method you apply to selecting a sample size. So I, I don't know how to, uh, which method we should apply to select a proper sample size in primary uh, uh, data. So no, that's no, see, why there, are, there are different see the one method is snowball sampling that you talk to one woman entrepreneur and you ask her to introduce you to the other one so you it's like a snowball one place to the other you keep building on that okay the yes, other yes, is yes, clearly yes, known as non probability huh? sampling huh? So, uh, basically i have to do non probability sampling but they are not satisfied if i uh, 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 told this answer they mm -hmm. are not satisfied because they mm -hmm. want me to uh, a method and I don't know. I search it uh, from uh, everywhere. I, I get find one formula which is I think which is not uh, uh, good for in, in my field. So that's why I'm asking this question. No, no, no. You are right. See, the problem is that we are dealing with a, a situation where if you don't know in advance who these people are, then you cannot have a strict method. Yes, sir. See, something like when we know that in these five buildings, let's say there are women entrepreneurs. Okay? We will actually do a quota sampling. 
which means we will select 100 sample from each building. That is not the case with your situation. There is also something called opportunistic sampling. That you don't have a choice, but you go and you pick up anyone you get. So what you have to do is you pick up any research method book and read different kinds of sampling methods within qualitative research. Okay, and you cannot have a straightforward answer. If, for, for example, if you are relying pretty much on informal mechanisms, then you can't say that this is the only way. Uh, like election studies, what they do is they go every 10th household. Because it is clear that you can go to every 10th household. Yes, but in your case, you can't go to every 10th household. How can you do that? Okay, sir. So I think I would say, first of all, go and pick up any good qualitative research method book and read different methods. See, actually, uh, it's also about labeling. It's what you may do. You can fit into some label. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so first of all, I would say that if label is a problem, just go and read any qualitative, good qualitative research method book. You can find on LibGen or any other platform. Download that and read method like focus group discussion, informal conversation. These are mechanisms of data collection. So it's not a big problem, I would say. Don't worry too much about it. Oh, okay, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. So anyone ask the questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, yes, sir. Yes. My name is Lavanya and I'm a research scholar at Dalbag Educational Institute. Sir, I want to ask about, uh, like I want to interview executives of some brands like mm -hmm. Tanish, Malabar, Golden Diamonds. But what should be my approach because they don't have enough time to fill questionnaire. So what method should I adopt? See, I explained certain things, something as uh, informal question, like uh, informal mechanism. Uh, you can't actually, uh, as long as they allow you to record, it's perfectly fine. Uh, if not, what you need to do is you have to memorize 10 questions at least. Then you have to have some sequencing in your mind. You go there and you start uh, making notes. Are they comfortable you making notes in the notebook? Yes, sir. Uh, few of them are comfortable and uh, few of them I haven't. Uh, it's basically uh, they don't want to reveal their strategies of customers retaining. So I don't know. Till no, what so, level so, see, it's not about anything about that. You have to make them comfortable by talking to them, saying that, look, what I'm doing is exclusively, first of all, for research purpose. Second thing is you will anonymize all the names. In fact, you will not even record the names except for their otherwise background, socioeconomic background. And therefore, it's about gaining the confidence. And in order to gain the confidence, either you have to spend more time or the second mechanism of gaining confidence is you need a gatekeeper. And you need a gatekeeper who will actually introduce you to these people and who will tell them, look, just coordinate with this person. It's only for research purpose. Then they will be actually comfortable. Talking. So you need to find a better uh, gatekeeper for that. All right, sir. And sir, uh, could you guide about review papers also? Uh, literature review? Yes, sir. See, literature review, uh, one thing we don't do well is uh, we have to focus on what is called as purposive analysis of literature. Now, literature review doesn't mean everything and uh, anything that is written under the sun we have to write. Okay. We have a particular question and in relation to that question, you have to pick up what kind of people have spoken on that phenomenon, largely speaking. So like uh, my objective, one of the objective uh, in my thesis is to study the existing models.